You're listening to the Light for Living podcast, featuring the sermons of Emmanuel Baptist Church in El Dorado, Arkansas, where Dr. Clark Whitney serves as senior pastor. Join us for verse-by-verse messages through the life-changing Word of God. Along the way, we'll also feature devotional thoughts, Bible studies, and interviews, all designed to help you grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. If you have a Bible, I invite you to take it out and turn to Romans chapter 11. She's making a run for daddy. Uh, She loves daddy. All right, how about that? Very good. The Bible says, unless you humble yourself like a little child. Today we're going to be talking about humility and teachability. And would we all be a little baby run into the father's arms? That would be a good heart posture to begin today. I would ask a question. I'm just curious. How many of you have a hobby of sewing or knitting, cross-stitching? I'm very impressed. It takes a lot of patience more than I have to sew. We take things for granted, being able to go to the store and buy clothes. My grandmother, she sewed clothes for all three little girls in her family. What patience and love was uh, stitched together. The symbol today, as we continue our series, Traits of the Greats, is a thimble. A thimble. If you've never seen one of these, it's used in sewing. And it's used to protect your finger from pricking itself. If I took up sewing, I probably would have to have ten of these, one for each finger. But if you would like, we have a, a little gift in the lobby today, a thimble for you. A thimble. With each message, we have a little symbol to go with each trait. If you'll remember, we talked about a couple of weeks ago, the greatest among you will be a servant. And we had little towels. And boy, did you get to hear from one of God's greats last week, Pastor Tim Cox. What a blessing. And you got to see someone who's doing that, serving the Lord and in all humility. And this week, we're continuing on a little bit further. I want to talk to you about humility and teachability. The, the thimble... It represents humility and teachability. You say, well, how? You may have heard the phrase, just a thimbleful. Just a thimbleful. A thimbleful means just a little bitty bit. Not a whole lot, just a little bit. Before I even had it laid on my heart for this series, I keep a little thimble just like this on the windowsill by my desk. And if you've ever been to my office, please come see me sometime. Sometimes I get lonely back there. But I've got a book problem, if you've ever been in there. And I I, I love books. I love reading books. I love reading what great minds have thought throughout history in their life. I really like biographies and to read some of the greats. And I have some, some things that are special, maybe only to me, some diplomas from education and so forth. And what the little thimble reminds me of is that if I could wrap all of that up, and all the books and all of, of the wisdom of all of the men and women who've wrote those books, as wonderful as they are, and my education and, and ordination and all that, and as wonderful as that is, and if I were to roll it all up, I would never arrive. In fact, I'd never even have a thimbleful compared to the knowledge and wisdom of God. And I have to approach every message and every day with the heart posture of a little child, uh, of someone that comes to the Father and says, God, would you teach me? Because if I think I have it all together, I'm setting myself up for a fall. I want you to know today that you can be too big for God to use you. But you can never be too small for God to use you. You can be too big, too great in the world's eyes for God to use you. But you can never be too small and too humble for God to fill you up and to use you. I want to read to you a few passages today really because humility is a theme woven throughout the whole Bible. You don't have to turn to all of them. They'll be on your screen. But we'll begin in Romans chapter 11 beginning in verse 33. If you got it, say got it. Now think about the thimble, but think about what it says about God. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. Oh, the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the might of the Lord? I'm reading the old King James Version, okay? It's good. And who hath been his counselor? 
or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. For of him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Psalm 25 verse 4 says, Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me, teach me, teach me your paths. Proverbs 22, 4. The reward of humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. I want to read you one more, 1 Corinthians 1. It's not on your screen, but listen. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful, and not many were of noble birth. Not many of you, the Bible's saying, were great in the world's eyes. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Would you bow your head and your heart in the presence of God this morning? God, we can't even boast in your presence. God, we're not great. And to think that we are would be very prideful to admit something that is simply not true. And oh, the depths of your knowledge and wisdom. And God, we just have a thimbleful. So God, as we humble our hearts, God, speak to us. Show us what we need to see and, and let us hear what we need to hear that we might be changed on the inside. God, help us see the lesson of greatness found in humility and teachability. Help us never think we have it all together. And as always, God, we pray you would increase and we would decrease. We ask it with a grateful heart and we ask it in faith in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Well, I like going to Branson and there's many things you can waste your money on in Branson. But I will give you a travel recommendation the next time you're up there. If you haven't been, go to the aquarium. Go to the aquarium. You can't miss it. It's on the main drag, which is by the Walmart. Go figure. There's a big giant octopus. Has anyone been to this aquarium? It is, you need to go. It is really good. Even for Branson, it's good, okay? And we found ourselves with some time to spare in Branson a few weeks ago, and we took the kids to this aquarium. And it is fantastic. In fact, we pretty much had the entire place all to ourselves. We left our phone in the car, got to focus on the kids and to see their excitement and got to see some amazing things that God has made. I've never been scuba diving, but if you have gone scuba diving and you've seen one of these fish, as you can see at the aquarium, you might want to swim the other direction. And we'll get it up here in just a minute. Don't let it surprise you when it pops on the screen. But what you'll see in a moment is a puffer fish, a puffer fish. Did you know that a puffer fish can inhale water and air and become several times its size. Well, no, no duh. That's a puffer, okay? Well, did you also know that they can puff themselves up for the predator, but if the predator gets close enough to it, most puffer fish, many of them, have a toxic poison that is 1,200 times more deadly than cyanide. 1,200 times. There is no known antidote to that poison. There's enough poison uh, like this in one puffer fish to kill 30 adult human beings. If you see a puffer fish, I suggest you swim the other way. What does the puffer fish and a thimble have to do with pride? When we become prideful, when we think we don't need God, as we have sung, God, I look to you, you're where my help comes from. You all know a puffer fish in your mind, so we don't even have to see the picture. It's fine. You've seen it. Go to National Geographic Kids. That's where I got all my information. Okay. All right. There we go. Thank you, guys. Our guys work so hard. They, got, they really do a great job. I want to brag on our staff for just a moment. I was going to do this at the end of the service. I'm going to go ahead and do it just since the guys put themselves on the spot. But yesterday I was up here. We had one person on our staff cleaning, two fellows working on the media, and we had four on the road doing block party training, two out in the community. Uh, spouses and staff, and we have a wonderful staff. We have a wonderful church. 
they do so much behind the scenes. So thank you guys for what you do. Seriously, they do so much. Hours really goes in. Thank you guys. And it's really my fault because I put that puffer fish there about two hours ago, and it's my fault. But, but pride is a poison. You can become puffed up like a puffer fish, and you can suck up and puff up with things you really don't have. Okay? You can write a check with your mouth that you really can't cash. And the pride is the poison. It's a very potent poison. It's very alluring. And it's just as deadly as the pride of the puffer fish. When you and I become puffed up like a puffer fish, we're in danger of pride. The first point I want you to see today is simply this. There is a God. You are not him. There is a God. You are not him. You would think that would be a basic statement, but it's a countercultural statement because everybody wants to be their own God. We've taken God out of the equation, and we've led ourselves to confusion. Everybody, just like in the Old Testament, is doing what's right in their own eyes. And you can't even say what a man is or what a woman is. We're so confused because we've forgotten this simple truth. There is a God, and you and I are not him. And we have to humble ourselves before we can even understand anything. We have to admit that there's something, no, there's someone who's higher than us. We have to admit there is a God. We're not him. He has been before us. He will be after us. He is the I am who was before and who is and who is to come. He is not like us. Before time began or even the world began or the puffer fish puffed up, he is the I am eternal God. And in Romans it says, Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. How unsearchable are his ways and they're past finding out. The depths, if you were to go to the deepest part of the ocean, over 35,000 feet deep. Think about going that far deep. No sunlight. God's knowledge and wisdom are deeper still. All the things we think we know are, are just a little thimble compared to what he knows, to the depth of his knowledge. We'll never be able to wrap our head around him. We just got to let God be God. Sometimes we don't have the answers. Sometimes we don't understand. But even when we don't know and we can't understand, we can trust. And we can trust that there is a God out there. And not only does he know more than we know, he cares and he loves us. And he wants us to trust him. There is a God. We're not him. I used to listen to Stephen Curtis Chapman before he got old. And he had a wonderful song. My dad really listened to him, and I'd have to listen to him in the car. I'd be stuck in my dad's Jeep, and we just listened on CDs. He didn't have XM radio or streaming. But there is a song from him, and I, I want to read just a few of the lyrics. Can I form a single mountain, take the stars in hand, and count them? Can I even take a breath without God giving it to me? He is the first and the last before all that has been beyond all that will pass. God is God and I'm not. I can only see a part of the picture he's painting. God is God and I am man. And so I'll never understand it all for only God is God. Let God be God. Trust him, obey him. Seek him. My thoughts are not your thoughts, the Bible says in Isaiah 55. Neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. If you're worshiping a God that's just like you, you're not worshiping the God of the Bible. If you can wrap your head around him and put him in a box, maybe he is a figment of your own imagination. The Ancient of Days tells us his thoughts are not our thoughts, his ways are not our ways. And as high as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now, you think 35,000 feet is deep. The end of the universe, what we can see is 46.5 light years, billion light years away. And God is even beyond that. His thoughts are, are higher than even the heavens are above the earth. Even more than 45.6 billion light years, his ways and his thoughts are greater than us. Uh, like Forrest Gump, I'm not a smart man. But I'm smart enough to know what I don't know. And I pray I'll always know that there is a God. I'm not him. 
1 Corinthians 8, 2 says, If anyone thinks he knows anything, he knows nothing as yet he ought to know. If anyone thinks he knows anything, he really knows nothing as he ought to know. And this leads to the second point I want to give you today. Pride leads to a fall. Humility leads to greatness. Pride, putting yourself in the place of God, will certainly lead to a fall one day. Humility leads to greatness. You can't be puffed up with pride and and care for people. You can't be full of yourself and full of the Holy Spirit at the same time. It's one way or another. You are either prideful or you humble yourself before God. Proverbs 16 and 18 says, Pride goes before destruction. Pride goes before destruction. And a haughty spirit before a fall. You see, the prideful person says more than he knows, but the humble person knows more than he says. The prideful person says more than he knows. The humble person knows more than he says. A humble person sits down when others walk. A humble person listens when other people talk. And a humble person loves people even beyond their faults. Alexander the Great, he's known as the Great because in 13 short years, he amassed the, the, the greatest empire in the history of the ancient world at that time. The empire covered 3,000 miles from Greece to India to Egypt. And there was a poet that, that wrote after his death that, The whole world had not been big enough to contain Alexander the Great. But in the end, a coffin was sufficient. The whole world wasn't big enough to hold his ego and his pride. But in the end, Alexander the Great was humbled just like each and every one of us. The paradox of success, whether it's in education or sports or business or even in spiritual success, is that the higher you climb, the more in danger you are of falling. The higher and higher you climb, the greater and greater you get in the world's eyes, the more and more in danger you are of falling because you're more and more in danger of attributing your success to yourself. And when you do that, you begin to puff up with pride. There's a temptation to say, I made it here on my own. But the Bible says that pride goes before destruction. One of the greatest pieces of advice I've ever heard about the ministry is that to be a pastor, you have to take your ministry seriously, but don't take yourself seriously. Take your job seriously, whatever you do. Take it seriously, do it unto God, but don't take yourself so seriously. If you do, you're setting yourself up for a letdown. I want to give you an example of humility leading to greatness. Not Alexander the Great, but another great one, Sir Isaac Newton. We all know the story, the apple falling on his head, discovering gravity. Here's what he said. If I have seen further than others, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. If you discover gravity, I think you know what you're talking about. If I've seen further than other people, Newton said, it's because I stand on the shoulders of giants. Now you and I, whatever success we have in life, hard work and persistence and perseverance, that's important. And doing our best and saying our best has been done, that's important too. But to think that any of us got where we are today without the help of somebody else and without the help of Almighty God is the epitome of pride. To think that I've made it, I did this, look at all that I've done for myself. No, 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 no. You and I stand on the shoulders of giants. Who helped you? Who taught you your your career, showed you the ropes when you didn't know what you were doing? Who was a teacher that helped you in school? When you first started following Jesus, who was somebody that that lovingly encouraged you when you started going in the wrong direction? Each and every one of us have teachers and have people who help us. And most of all, we have God who helps us. And we can be too big for God to use us, but we can never be too small for God to use us. Pride leads to disgrace, Proverbs 11, 2, but with humility comes wisdom. The key to unlocking the, the solutions to our problems in life to our difficulties, our disappointments, all all of, of the problems in life, the humility leads to the wisdom from God. The pride leads to destruction, but when we humble ourselves, we get to tap into a wisdom and a knowledge that is higher than the heavens above the earth. And we'll never stand taller than when we're on our knees. It's a great paradox 
that the way up to greatness is down in humility. The, the way to be truly great is to admit you're not great and to humble yourself before God. Ronald Reagan had a plaque on his desk, and this would be a good one for every politician. There is no limit to how far a person can go as long as he doesn't care who gets the credit. There's no limit to what you can do in life as long as you don't care who gets the credit. I would add as long as you're doing it for God to his glory. There's no limit to how far a church can go as long as there's not one person showboating and saying, I want the credit on me. I need the spotlight. When you put the spotlight on Jesus, there's no limit to how much he can use you. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's just thinking of yourself less. It's just thinking of yourself less and putting other people in front of you and putting God first and foremost of all. It's putting yourself in a position for God to teach you his greatness. You see, humility and teachability, they go together. The thimble, humility, teachability. You may know the story of Ben Carson. You may not know he grew up in poverty, raised by a single mother, he and his brother, Curtis. He was the youngest physician to ever lead a division at the famous Johns Hopkins Hospital. He was the first to separate conjoined twins at the head. Very famous neurosurgeon, won the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Life is chronicled in the book and movie Gifted Hands. The book's even better than the movie. What made the difference to go from this, this boy who grew up in Detroit with a single mom and his teacher told him he was stupid? I wouldn't let my child say that word, but that's what she told him. What made the difference that he would go on to lead a division at Johns Hopkins, even be a member of the United States cabinet? Well, it was his mother. His mother, Sonia, grew up in a, a foster home. She received literally a, only a third grade education, didn't go any farther than that. She met a man in her teen years that was no good news. He was a little bit older than her. They married. She later found out he was a bigamist, had a secret family. So when Ben was eight years old and his brother Curtis was 10, that's a picture of Ben and his mother, uh, the parents separated. Sonia, his mom, was on her own. She moved to Boston where she lived with her sisters for just a little bit, ended up moving back to Detroit, at one time worked as many as three jobs to take care of those two boys. There were days when she left before the boys would get up and she got back late, late, late at night. Well, Ben was in the fifth grade, and he came home with a report card. Benny, as he was known at, at that age. And it was not a good report card. It was the kind that maybe you've hid from your parents, or you've had the kid hide from you. I guess it's all online now, so you can't hide anymore. And, and Sonia didn't know what to do. So she humbled herself. This lady of very humble means. She literally asked God, God, would you give me wisdom how to raise these boys? They're not going in a good direction. Well, she chose to limit her son's television shows to two a week. Kids, if you're listening, I pray your parents didn't hear that. Don't get any ideas, okay? Instead of watching the two, the two shows, that was the limit, she took them to the library. That simple choice changed their lives, Benny and Curtis. Each week, she required those boys, in addition to their schoolwork, to check out two books and to read them and to write a book report on what they read. She used a highlighter, and she'd go through and mark up the reports and grade them. Later, the boys were shocked to find out that the mother, Miss, Miss Sonia, had not even read the report. You want to know why? She couldn't read. Ben Carson said it only took him about a month before he was running home from school, rushing home to read his latest book. His mom was right. Reading did change his life, but so did his faith in God. He, he said, I, I not only saw and felt the difference my mother made in my life, I'm still living out that difference as a man. You think her investment didn't pay off? Sonia believed in the power of God and, and the education, and she told her boys, if you can read, honey, you can learn just about anything you want to know. When Ben was 14, not only did he struggle with, with learning problems, he struggled with excessive anger issues. He had a problem with anger. He almost took the life of another boy. He said he prayed for God's help. He picked up a Bible and turned to Proverbs where it has a lot to say about the problem of anger. 
And to this day, he believes that God is the one who took away his temper and allowed him to have those gifted hands as a neurosurgeon. So, so what did God use to take a single mom from Detroit with two boys and, and to make world-class difference makers to do something truly great through her? Well, yeah, it was books and education and, and I'm sure God's people helping along the way. But the characteristic I see and the great person I want you to focus on is not Ben, but his mom. Sonia, what did she use? She used humility and teachability. Humility and teachability. That's the last point I want you to see today, is that when you acknowledge there is a God and you're not him, and you realize that pride leads to a fall, but humility leads to greatness, I want you to know God wants to teach you about his greatness. God wants to teach you something. Once you've humbled himself, yourself, he wants to teach you, number one, through his word. It, reading books are important. I, I think it's paramount to having a sharp mind at any age. Did you know that your brain, God has created it where it doesn't stay the same? You can literally change your brain, neuroplasticity. I'm not a neurosurgeon, but I've read a lot about it. You can retrain your brain. The Bible calls it being conformed by the renewing of your mind. It's nothing new, but God's created you to be renewed. He's created you to learn at whatever age you have. And when you read good books, maybe you go down to Jefferson Street Books and drop some money and buy some good books, okay? When you read good books, you tap into the great minds. You learn from, from people, and you can also learn from their mistakes. That'll save you some pain. But, but when you learn all these good books, be sure that you live in the Bible. Charles Spurgeon said, visit many good books, but live in the Bible. Visit many good books, but live in the Bible. When we read other people's stuff, we read their thoughts. But when we read the Bible, we read God's thoughts. And if his thoughts are higher than ours, and his ways above ours, as far as the heaven is above the earth, don't you think there's something he wants to teach us if he's given us his word and his spirit through his word? This book is God breathed. Someone said, we read other books, the Bible reads us. It's supernatural. It will do for you in your life what no other book will do. Because the author uses it by his spirit to change and transform your life. Amen? Romans 15, 4 says, whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction. And that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. If you want to know what God wants you to know, but more than that, if you want to have hope for the situation you're facing, God has given you the Bible. It's written so that you might have encouragement through the Scripture. The thimble to me also represents God's Word, that I'll never know all of God's Word. I'll never have it all figured out. I come to it each time I need to come to it like a little child and say, God, teach me. The power is in the Word and the Spirit, and God's Word is gold. Psalm 19 verse 10 says, More to be desired, talking about God's Word, than gold. Well, through His Word, but with His wisdom. God wants to give you wisdom for each situation you face. Sometimes people will come to my office or stop me, and they'll describe a situation that I have no idea what to say. But I can always point them to this one verse in James 1.5. And if you're going to memorize one, it'd be a good one to memorize. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously. He gives his wisdom to all without reproach, and it might be given to him. It, it, it may if he's feeling good on that day. The Bible says, if you lack wisdom, he gives it when you ask him for it. The next verse says you've got to ask him in faith without doubting. When we come to God and say, God, you're God, I'm not, teach me. Then he wants to give you his wisdom. Sometimes the toughest part is us asking for help. But not only does he want to teach us through his word, with his wisdom, by his spirit, by his spirit. The Holy Spirit is the master teacher. And when you're saved, you're indwelt with the Holy Spirit. That's what the Bible teaches, that God comes to live inside of you through his Spirit. Not that you're perfect, but that he's renewing you and he's changing you to be more like Jesus. That you're not staying the same because he's doing a work of grace in your life. And Jesus said, before he died, I'm going to leave you to his disciples, but I'm not going to leave you as orphans. In John 14, 26, he said, I'm going to send a helper 
And the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you. He will teach you all the things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. The Holy Spirit is the master teacher. We could have line up all the professors in all the world, the experts on every subject. I still would want the Holy Spirit. I would want the teaching of the Holy Spirit to bring to my remembrance all that I needed to know, to give me the wisdom through the Word of God. Well, I just have a thimble. He has an ocean. I just have a little bitty bit. But God has oceans and oceans of wisdom and knowledge and grace. I want to just give a few thoughts as I think about people who I, I've known as great. Remember, Jesus turned greatness on its head. This isn't in your notes. It's just extra because I got about three more minutes. But I'll go longer than that if I need to. The, the greatness comes through humility. It comes through service. Jesus said, the greatest among you will be a servant. When I think about Sonia Carson, I think about the third grade Sunday school teacher named Sandy Ives, who had a little pulpit about this tall that gave me parts of the lesson to teach. Those are the real greats. And when I think about their lives, here's a few things that I think about. The greats learn for a lifetime. I'm not saying they go back to college and they have all these degrees. Some of the smartest people I know never had a lick of education. Education is important. I, I suggest as much as God wants you to have, you get. But the true greats learn for a lifetime. No matter, don't let the world put limitations on you or what some teacher said or what somebody said about you. You can learn when you come to God. The greats never stop growing. All growth in life happens outside of your comfort zone outside of my comfort zone. You don't think I get nervous before I get up here? Growth happens when you're on the edge of your comfort zone. If you think you've got it, that's probably a sign that you're puffed up with pride. But God wants to push you to the limits of what you can do so he can show you what he can do. Amen? The greats never have arrived. They never reach a point where they say, I I've made it. I'm just going to sit back I've done all that I want to do. I've accomplished everything I need to accomplish. The greats never get over the Word of God. They never just put the Bible on the shelf and say, I, I've got it. I understand it. The, the greats never do that. They always come back to the Word and say, God, would you teach me? And last, the greats never get over their salvation. The most humbling moment of all. When you and I come to God and say, God, I can't do this on my own. There's nothing good in me, but God, I humble myself and I ask you to come into my life. That's a moment of humility, but it's also a moment of transformation. Because it's that moment that you realize your weakness, that God begins to show himself strong. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but somebody needs to hear it. When you're weak, he is strong. And at the moment of salvation, we come to him and say, God, we're weak and we're wounded. And most of all, God, we're wicked. Because of our sin, we have been separated from you. But God... We believe, I believe, Jesus died in my place. That he humbled himself, the Bible says, and became obedient even to the point of death on a cross. He took the lowest station so that you and I could have eternal life. And when I come to Jesus, wicked and wounded and weary, and, and all my limitations and say, God, I can't do it, he shows his strength. But guess what? He doesn't want us to get over the grace that he saved us by. We are always growing in grace. And we come to God, not the same as we once was, but thank God we are being changed. And we come to him and we say, God, just like a little child, just like the little girl running up to her father, you've saved me, but God, I need your strength today. Whether you've known him for 50 years or five minutes, you need to know your salvation. Thank you for joining us today. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and share with a friend. We hope you'll tune back in next time to the Light for Living podcast.